This video is made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Check out patreon.com slash nwr for all the details. Twenty twenty has been quite the year. Regardless of where you live and what you believe, 2020 has been unifying in the worst way possible. We've all gone through a lot this year. With that in mind, we opted not to do our traditional Game of the Year deliberations. Instead, I asked the staff of Nintendo World Report what games made a difference for them this year. Be it ways to connect with friends while in quarantine, a distraction from social and political upheaval, or just a little bit of normalcy in a year custom built to squash it out. So no, these may not all be the best games of the year from a critical perspective. But from a human perspective, these were the games that made our 2020 a little bit better. From Stephen Green, the Pokemon Sword and Shield Expansion Pass. Following the release of the 8th generation of Pokemon Sword and Shield, it was announced we would be receiving Pokemon's first set of story DLC for a mainline title with the Isle of Armor and the Crown Tundra. Although as a whole this entry may not have lived up to the high expectations, the DLC surprised by offering an arguably more interesting story and an improved wild area for our monster catching shenanigans. Between the dojo training and exciting new slowpoke lineage from the Isle of Armor, and the snow covered landscapes filled with legendary hunting in the Crown Tundra, the enjoyable times on offer in these releases allowed for Pokemon goodness in an otherwise rough 2020 which was definitely appreciated by this Pokemania. From Neil Ronahan, Picross. Just, just all of them. Multiple nights throughout 2020 ended with me following the news and getting anxious and concerned, and it hit me near the end of the year that the steadiness of quality Picross games were key factors in helping me level out my brain. The Wizards at Jupiter delivered not one, but two new entries in their Picross S franchise both of which just kept delivering polished and enjoyable puzzle-solving content. I devoured both games, usually ending my nights playing a couple puzzles to relax. But outside of Picross S4 and S5, three other Picross-heavy games came out in 2020 and mixed the enjoyable nonograms with other genres. Murder by Numbers combined it with an Ace Attorney-style visual novel structure, Pixel Cross Adventures experimented with some light open-world RPG gameplay with picture puzzle accents. Pixel Puzzle Makeout League mixed solving puzzles with a shockingly heartfelt and insane dating sim-inspired storyline. All three of those games further expanded what it means to be a Picross game, and as someone who essentially solves Picross puzzles for breakfast every day, I'm happy to see the landscape be more than just the straightforward missives from Jupiter every year or so. It's also worth calling out two other games I played in 2020, Depiction and Voxelgram. Depiction's major hook is that it focuses more on color puzzles, and Voxelgram is indie Picross 3D. I'm sure other quality Picross-inspired games are also out there. Hopefully, I'll find more of them in 2021. From Joshua Robin, Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics. I never expected to own Clubhouse Games, let alone love it. We really only bought it due to my partner's sister buying a Switch. She wanted a game with online play that we could play together. She already bought Mario Kart 8, and a lot of the other candidates that immediately come to mind don't actually support online. So we looked at Clubhouse games due to other options being slim. We watched a trailer of all the included games, and it was very impressive. There are versions of chess, checkers, two types of shogi, Three kinds of solitaire, backgammon, Chinese checkers, last card, uno, ludo, sorry, yacht dice, yahtzee, mancala, and dominoes. We bought it, and it's been great as a connection game. For everything that is good about Mario Kart 8, it isn't a sit down and catch up kind of game, but nearly everything among the 51 worldwide classics is. I grew up playing some of these games with family that I haven't seen in a while and it's been easy to slot Clubhouse games into the same function. I'm planning on buying my sister a copy for Christmas because I want to be able to play Last Card with her like we would on family vacations. How easy it is to use Clubhouse games as a social game is aided by how streamlined it is to set up an online lobby. One player starts a room, people join that room, then they can start picking games. 
It's exactly how I want online functionality to work. There's no talking to another in-game character or trying to join a player's queue that's already running. I'm looking at you, Animal Crossing New Horizon and Splatoon 2. This is the game that my partner's parents bought a Switch for. I fully believe that they'll be able to handle joining an online lobby. It's that simple. Nintendo is likely to be the publisher of a game that made anyone's 2020 better, even if they don't write for a Nintendo enthusiast website. However, I never would have expected that the game to give me so much in such a terrible year would be Clubhouse Games' 51 Worldwide Classics. What I've gained even transcends owning a Switch. I work in a research lab as my day job. It's an industry that does a lot of recruiting internationally. I enjoy my job, and I like all my coworkers. But 2020 has robbed me of the ability to feel comfortable around groups of people larger than three. I had rarely woken up dreading going to work before this year. Some small respites from that feeling were being able to talk to my coworkers about board games from the regions they're from. I don't have the cultural touchstone of growing up with Mahjong, but I can now play it decently enough to talk about it with my coworkers from China. Learning Karam means I could have a small conversation with my coworkers from India that hopefully doesn't devolve into talking about the pandemic. Nintendo published a collection of games that made my year better, partly through their own design and another part of falling into circumstance. But that doesn't take away from the fact that Clubhouse Games' 51 Worldwide Classics made my year better. From Justin Berube, Super Mario Bros. 35. Super Mario Bros. 35 takes the most iconic Nintendo game and mixes it with the modern Battle Royale features found in Tetris 99. While both things are far from fresh, together they made something truly special. Once I started playing this game, I was totally hooked, and after a few rounds, I started to dominate. It was as if all those years of playing Super Mario Bros. crafted me into an online Mario warrior able to outlast any opponent. It felt great. While the game may not be perfect, it has a ton of potential to expand. Sadly, it's set to be retired after March 2021. My biggest hope is that a more full-featured version releases soon, in order to make next year better than the one we got this year. Until then, fear me, for I am the Mushroom Kingdom's new master. From Donald Terrio, Fire Emblem Three Houses, Cindered Shadows. In a year that was so focused on staying home for medical reasons, I was self-quarantining before it was cool. After a protracted hospital stay in December of 2019, I was essentially homebound and off work for an entire calendar quarter. Smack in the middle of this staycation came the final part of Fire Emblem Three Houses Expansion Pass, and it started me down a road that essentially carried me past Animal Crossing, Xenoblade, Clubhouse Games, and almost until Paper Mario. It was really a domino effect. I had stalled on my second run through Three Houses, but I wanted to see how the people of the Ashen Wolves would fare in a normal playthrough, so I picked my run with the Blue Lions back up. This led to wanting to see how the Golden Deer played, then needing to double back to pick up a character's relationship with the Black Eagles, and finally getting the last support for my Bylass. And with one character left for all the other supports, why not roll through again as Bylad? It even gave me a chance to create a literal god, and do things with the students of Garagmok that would drive most people mad. Yes, I turned the meek cleric Mercedes into the army's leading pugilist, and I don't regret it for a minute. My time count at the end of the first time I rolled credits was about 70 hours. There's a couple of screenshots I took from my files recently. The Blue Lions run ended at 160 hours of game time, and the final file, for now, is at 710. And I still want to do one more run, because there's a couple of classes I didn't get to master as a female, and they're gender locked for some stupid reason. Three Houses was our 2019 game of the year, and the main reason I'm not doing a top whatever list for 2020 is because I'm pretty sure Three Houses would still be on that list. From Neil Ronahan, Super Mega Baseball 3. Returning from PAX East 2020 in early March was a weird feeling. COVID-19 got increasingly real in America over the weekend. It was an enjoyable but tense time as no one shook hands, hand sanitizer was everywhere, and to my knowledge, the virus miraculously didn't spread through the packed convention center. I had no idea that that trip to Boston would be the last trip I'd take in 2020. But something that made the slow realization that things were going to get real bad was an email from a PR representative that shared an embargoed piece of news about Super Mega Baseball 3 coming out soon to Switch. 
I'm a fanatical zealot for Super Mega Baseball. I don't remember who it was, comment if it was you, but when the first game came out, someone periodically messaged me being like, this is your jam, and I ignored it at first. When I finally played it, I was hooked. This is the best feel of a baseball game this side of MVP Baseball 2005. With flexible difficulty levels, a surprisingly approachable style, and lots of fun flavor and personality. The sequel came out a few years later, then landed on Switch in 2019, where I successfully exerted my will and got it into our top 10 games of 2019. Since we don't have that list this year, I just need to call out Super Mega Baseball 3 as the masterpiece that it is. It's a refined version of the second game, which was already borderline immaculate. It brought me great joy throughout this tough year, whether it was with one of the fun included fictional teams or my custom Final Fantasy squad. And hey, if you want some sports joy, there's a very generous free demo that lets you play online. From Jordan Rudek, Trials of Mana. The remake of Trials of Mana released on April 24th, which also happens to be my birthday. I had the privilege of reviewing the game for Nintendo World Report, and it ended up being not only one of my most glowing reviews of the year, but also a personal favorite. I, like many people, have sought refuge from the onslaught of isolation, despair, and tumult brought on by 2020 in video games, and one that really helped me manage not being able to see my friends and family around the time I turned 35 was the Switch version of Trials of Mana. I love RPGs that provide the player with meaningful choices, and one of the most immediate and impactful choices you make in Trial of Mana is that of choosing your primary character, whose story beats take center stage during that playthrough. As it turns out, you also choose your second and third party members at that time as well, and so it would seem that a lot rests on the opening minutes of that game, before the action or story even starts. Later on, your characters can also undergo class changes, opting for different fighting styles or pursuing a more support-based or damage-based focus. Customizing not only who your party members are initially, but also the characters they end up becoming was incredibly satisfying. I have to say, it was really nice to have a modicum of agency and freedom in a year filled with restrictions and barriers. The lush environments and fantastic score make traipsing through the world of Trials of Mana an absolute joy. Even though the story is linear and the exploration scarce, the satisfying action combat, constant progression, and vibrant presentation all culminate in an overwhelmingly positive gameplay experience. I would say that Trials of Mana is a very difficult game not to like. I can understand not falling in love with it. The towns offer no side quests or much in the way of meaningful NPC dialogue, but the minute-to-minute -minute running, sword swinging, and spell casting are among the cleanest and most accessible on Switch. It doesn't hurt that returning to the game to play as a new set of characters adds worthwhile replay value. I continue to recommend it to RPG fans and even new Switch owners looking for something different. Trials of Mana was a definite bright spot of 2020, and if you haven't tried it yet, it might just be the same for you. From Justin Berube, Arcade Archives Super Punch-Out. The 1985 Arcade Archives Super Punch-Out isn't a game many people talk about, and probably for good reason. I've never seen a Super Punch-Out cabinet, and it has never been re-released. That is, until 2020. Super Punch-Out is a fun follow-up to the original arcade game and adds a new gameplay mechanic, lifting the stick up to duck. While this new action gets converted to a button press on Switch, it's still fun. The original is one of Nintendo's best arcade games, and this sequel is right up there with it. While this package has some flaws, some arcade archive glitches, and it only includes the Japanese ROM, I still had a blast. Going for better scores and trying to climb the ranks of the online leaderboards offered in the Arcade Archives version was a great distraction in the chaos this year brought upon us. From Donald Terrio, Collar X Malice. 2020 was the year I let my Otome Freak flag fly at full mast. The Venn diagram of Donald BS and manga-style visual novels was always concentric circles, but when Axis announced at Anime Expo 2019 that they were localizing six different Otome games in 2020, I was in heaven. In fact, I may have turned to my roommate and said, challenge accepted, when that news story was posted. Of that sextet of sexy time, the most striking game of the bunch was Colorex Malice. It's a game set in the modern day, in a location under quarantine, and it predominantly involved police officers getting justice. Even the main character's day job was answering the phone all day and dealing with demanding people. That's what I've done for a living since I was in university. Tumblr X Malice was one virus away from essentially being Donald Simulator 2020. 
if it wasn't for the pesky love portions. The Axis and Otome games make me laugh, cry, and scream in frustration. As an editor, the typos drove me up the wall, but they always came out at the right time, either right before a holiday or while I was on vacation. And Color X Malice is the one whose plot I'm still turning over in my head as the calendar turns over to 2021. From Joel DeWitt, Lonely Mountains Downhill. I've found since I've been working at home that it's been important to get a change of scenery, to keep cabin fever at bay. On warm days, that meant several hours of walking. But on rainy days and the coming winter, it'll be Lonely Mountains Downhill that brings the greater outdoors to my couch. Whether it's a wooded forest or dry, empty trails, the low-poly environments are so well utilized. The bright colors and clear outlines benefit the view by allowing focus on the rider, backgrounds whizzing by in a blur. The sounds of rushing water, birds chirping, and the wheels of your bike treading through grass and dirt are a wonderful ambient sound that evokes the outdoors perfectly. Other than the aesthetic, there's a nice sense of play-how-you-want pace to Lonely Mountains Downhill. Besides no pressure, take it your own pace runs, additional challenges like finishing in under three minutes and completing the course in 21 crashes or fewer give an opportunity to take more challenging routes. With the four mountains to unlock, there is a wide variety of roads to travel. A measured approach to difficulty and a layer of serenity in its sound, Lonely Mountains Downhill might be the perfect scenic getaway from the comfort of your own home. From Neil Ronahan, Paper Mario, The Origami King. I've already laid down my 2020 journey of coming around on Paper Mario Color Splash. The game is great, actually. And with my newfound appreciation for that odd Wii U duck, I expected to have fun with Origami King when it came out in summer of 2020. I didn't expect to love it as much as I did. The world looks wonderful, and it's fun to explore. I found myself trying to damn near 100% every area just because I was having fun looking around for toads and other secrets. The environments are way more expansive, whether it's an open field or an entire wind wakery sea portion. Two elements stood out for me outside of the visuals and exploration. One is a common positive for Origami King, the narrative and writing. Everything is a little bit jokey, but this story is packed with a shocking amount of heart. It's clear the writers really do love these goofy enemies and partners. Also, I've never met a reference to the band Pup I didn't like. The second element is one that probably only applies to me, because I actually really like the combat. Maybe the battles are a little bit too slow and frequent, but it's also relatively easy to avoid battles in some parts and make your own pace, so to speak. I liked the battles because they weren't so much combat as they were little puzzles. It was an engaging way to tweak some RPG conventions. Also, the boss battles, while desperately needing a quick retry option, are super fun and clever puzzle fights. This game rules, and I hope we get to keep seeing this weirder side of Nintendo blossom. From Justin Berube, Min Min for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. As a Master Mummy fan, I wasn't expecting much when we found out the arms fighter coming to Smash Ultimate would be Min Min. However, once I gave her a chance, I learned to stop worrying and to love the ramen bomber. I enjoy most of the unique gimmicky fighters in Smash Bros, and Min Min fits that role perfectly with her two arms. Attack twice in succession, change one of the arms, long offstage reaches. It's more fun than I was expecting, and she's definitely my favorite Smash DLC character of the year. From Justin Brube, Mario Kart Tour. Mario Kart Tour may not be a new game for 2020, but it has been getting decent bi-weekly updates throughout the year. Having a fun Mario Kart with me wherever I go has been great, and unlike what's found in Mario Kart 8, the single-player progression is fun. It's a slow burn that may not be for everyone, but if you give it a chance, you too may feel it's Nintendo's best mobile game. The mobile Mario Kart is easily one of Nintendo's most overlooked games in the current era, and it's been a welcome distraction for me in 2020. There are daily goals, larger goals, and always a competition going on that encourages players to get a better scoring run on a track. Even if this Mario Kart isn't something you want to go deep into, it's worth checking out for some of its good ideas that will hopefully make it into the next console Mario Kart title. In short, Mario Kart Tour kicks ass. From Matt Zawadniak, Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity. I have to admit, I'm the weirdo that likes to read fanfiction. Sure, 90% of fanfiction out there is 
pretty awful, but the rare stuff that actually gets the effort and attention it needs from the author can be even better than the actual official stories sometimes. Fanfiction can take risks that official material with a budget and a marketing team will often be afraid to. And it can also be easier to pick up and engage with because it focuses on characters and worlds we already know and love. That kind of comfort and familiarity has a strong appeal in a year like 2020, and Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity managed to give me all those same feelings when it released late into the year. It's a lot like a good fanfic, giving us a new opportunity to spend time with characters we know in a world that we know so well. And it touches on relatively obscure details and backstory beats that you'd expect a huge fan of Breath of the Wild to already know. At the same time, it manages to take those risks that you wouldn't expect from a typical entry into the Zelda franchise, fully committing to telling a direct prequel in a wildly different tone to the original. Instead of a sweeping adventure across a brave new world, we dive headfirst into a vicious war against the forces of evil and witness dazzling set pieces that showcase everything Breath of the Wild's world has to offer. In addition to all of this, it manages to bring new ideas to the Musou table that I hope have some influence in the franchise's future. The addition of the Flurry Rush and Sheikah Slate mechanics lifted straight from Breath of the Wild introduce a whole new level of depth and challenge to the Musou formula. Fixing a long-standing problem I've had with how much time is usually spent waiting around for bosses to show their weak point, it's easily my favorite Musou game ever made. And as the world began to lock down for a second time this autumn, it was a huge comfort to retreat back into a world I knew and get the chance to explore it all over again in a whole new light. From John Reardon, Rebel Galaxy Outlaw In 2020, I found myself craving a glimpse at normalcy, at the world I was used to rather than what it currently was. Rebel Galaxy Outlaw unexpectedly became that for me. As a throwback to the 3D space sims I had grown up with, and with enough RPG mechanics to feature just enough complexity, Rebel Galaxy Outlaw has been a game I've kept coming back to. There's just something about taking a job and setting out into the dark of space that makes the real world melt away. It takes a lot of what I love about classics like Wing Commander or more recent titles like No Man's Sky and formats it into a distilled experience that I can take anywhere. Whether hunting down pirates, taking on huge carriers, or responding to distress signals, Rebel Galaxy Outlaw offers incredible action. On the other hand, just trucking a crate full of beer from one system to another while listening to the radio, or stopping by a space station to play pool, makes the world feel rich and lived in. Rebel Galaxy Outlaw offered me a world to escape to that could be what I needed it to be when I needed it. It's a rare instance of a game simply living on my Switch home screen ever since its release. From Joe DeVader, Spirit Fair. Sometimes, especially in a year like 2020, the perfect game to pick up is one that cuts down on the excitement and leaves you room to just chill. There's a reason Animal Crossing took off so hard the way it did, but for my money, one of the unsung heroes of this type of game is Spirit Fair. A game about love, loss, and how to say goodbye might seem a bit on the nose for something like this, but to be quite honest, my time with Spirit Fair earlier this year was possibly one of the most zen periods I experienced. Imagine Stardew Valley, but mixed with the sailing of Wind Waker and the emotional weight of To the Moon, and what you get is a game that is intensely relaxing, except when it takes a little time off to break your heart in two, but in a bittersweet way. Spirit Fair is not something that will be everybody's bag, but its slow pace actually turned out to be relatively therapeutic for me all the way to the end. And for those who enjoy this kind of game, I imagine it will be for you too. The most important thing in life is to know when you need to stop and clear your mind for a bit. And I honestly can't think of a better game to do that with than with this one. From its wonderfully relaxing soundtrack to its beautiful art and setting, there is really no better place to get away from it all and just chill. From Katie Raritan, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Animal Crossing New Horizons made its debut on Switch in late March, as the world shut down and reality became increasingly more bleak. Our favorite Animal Crossing villagers stepped up and gave us a sunny, tropical adventure to ease our burdened hearts. Players had something to work towards, an outlet to connect with friends virtually and a renewed sense of purpose. Gardening virtual flowers became a tender and thoughtful task. Improving your island to attract a visit from K.K. Slider provided something to channel energy into that wasn't the news 
or poorly behaving neighbors, or any of the other countless stressors 2020 decided to heap on us. And on top of being a great outlet, Animal Crossing New Horizons invested right back into the player with seasonal updates. Charming birthday wishes and letters from mom, who we all know is a cornerstone of the Animal Crossing universe. Animal Crossing New Horizons gave us hope, joy, purpose, connection, and so much more. From wishing on a shooting star to sassy conversations with snowfolk, Animal Crossing New Horizons embraced players in a tropical hug, and players embraced it right back. From Joe DeVader, Hades. Of all the years for a game about crawling your way out of hell to release, 2020 seems like the most fitting year possible. There are many things I could tell you about Hades and why I think it made this year better. The gameplay is stellar, with combat feeling fast and responsive, and the narrative flowing seamlessly with the fact that you'll be dying over and over again. Speaking of the narrative, every single character in Hades is memorable, both in terms of design and personality, with each one having their own plot threads and an overall narrative about family and bringing people together for a common cause. There was also the fact that the game seemed to bring communities together in a way that I hadn't seen since last year's Untitled Goose Game, with fan art filling Twitter to the brim and everybody sharing their experiences with the game. It genuinely made a place commonly referred to as a hell site more pleasant than ever, even if just for a short amount of time. But if I'm being honest, I think one of the biggest accomplishments of Hades, and also of Supergiant games in general, is the way they gave me at least a little bit of hope for the industry at large. In a year where story upon story came out about horrible working conditions at big studios like Naughty Dog or CD Projekt Red, commonly featuring descriptions of 100-hour work weeks and severe burnout, it can get rather hard to feel like the people who make the games we play are valued, and even harder to feel like it'll ever get better. It was recently revealed that Supergiant not only has a policy of not crunching, but even requires its employees to take a certain amount of vacation per year. I cannot pretend to know how this type of system would scale to a bigger AAA project, but I do feel that this is the kind of system we should see as the future of our industry. The people who make our games matter, and the way things are done right now is not sustainable. Hades has shown us in multiple ways that better things are possible. This video was made possible by our generous supporters on Patreon. Did you know that Nintendo World Report is funded directly by fans like you? When you support Nintendo World Report on Patreon, you get immediate access to multiple exclusive podcasts every month, exclusive Discord channels, an early look at select content, and more. All for as little as a dollar a month. Check out patreon.com slash nwr for all the details.